All right, let's go to Einar Tangent, who is in Beijing. He is a China analyst and a commentator on international politics and economics. Einar, good to have you on the show. Um, help us understand something, because on the one hand, uh, you have Washington, which is affirming its one China policy, which is its own policy, uh, but this is not the same as Beijing's one China principle, right? Well, uh, the uh, U.S. position was affirmed in the Shanghai communique in, uh, I believe it was 1972. Um, and they, they acknowledged, you know, remember, they kicked Taiwan out of the U.N. and replaced it with the mainland and affirmed that there was only one China. But there was a kind of a ambiguity because they also passed this Taiwan Relations Act, which basically said any kind of disputes between uh, China and, and um Taiwan have to be, uh, any reunification has to be very peaceful. Uh, there was also a set of assurance, six assurances that were later uh, put into effect in 82, I believe. And those basically said that um, the U.S. would only sell arms to Taiwan that were, in essence, defensive in nature, extra spare parts, et cetera, and that they would not try to enhance uh, their, you know, their uh, military. Uh, but that has changed in recent years. Uh, the U.S. now, on average, sell, sails a uh, military aircraft through the Taiwan, uh, air, I mean, military naval ship through uh, the Taiwan Straits on more than once a month. Um, been doing that for quite some time. And uh, they've been selling uh, mo much more advanced uh, weapons and establishing relations and encouraging uh, Taiwan to believe that there is a path towards independence. This has enraged um, um, mainland China, which believes that this is a violation of the One China policy. Um, you know, in the U.S., they believe, I think they believe that they're just playing a card in order to deal with China and their desire to contain it. Uh, but for China, this is very serious business. This is a red line. Um, Taiwan being part of the mainland is in the Constitution. It's not something that's negotiable. Um, here's what the Taiwanese defense minister said. China already has the ability to invade Taiwan, and it will be capable of mounting a full-scale invasion by 2025. I mean, when I read into this, I have to ask you the question. I mean, isn't, aren't politicians or leaders just kicking the can down the road? Well, uh, uh, quite frankly, I mean, uh, Tying Wei was finished. Uh, I don't know if you recall a few years ago uh, before COVID. Uh, her, her party lost even their their home seat, and she looked. She had resigned from as party chairman, and she looked like she was going to, going to be pushed out. Uh, then Hong Kong came along, and uh, it revitalized her ability to uh, reclaim uh, the the top spot. Um, but she has not been able to move things uh, domestically, militarily. Talking about China is really the what gives oxygen to her her party. Um, but it's not clear where all of this is going to go. Taiwan is not in a position where it can be spending endless amounts of money buying U.S. hardware and going forward. In terms of things like the, uh, uh, the, fly, the fly throughs on these air zones, remember, Taiwan has a self-declared, not an internationally recognized no-fly zone. Um, and that is outside, you know, it, it, it claims more area than there. Those are the areas that uh, uh, China has been flying through. Uh, just like the U.S. claiming that they, uh, that they have a freedom of navigation right in those areas, uh, the, uh, China has never recognized uh, the self-declared uh, zone that uh, Taiwan has put up. But uh, in the international press, it's played out quite differently. Uh, it's acted as if this is a violation of, uh, uh, of you know, sovereign airspace, et cetera. Um, clearly, the Biden administration is, is, on the one hand, is putting on a face that it doesn't want to increase tensions with Beijing. We've seen this over the past several weeks. But then you have uh, deals like AUKUS, uh, which tells you uh, a different picture. How does sort of U.S. foreign policy uh, shape itself when it comes to this issue? Well, it's just not AUKUS. You also have the Quad out there, and uh, the U.S. Is, is pushing very heavily uh, for other, quote, uh, civilized or democratic nations to, uh, in essence, push back against China. Uh, there's this real geopolitical rivalry in the uh, U.S. interest. They basically saying this is a king of the hill battle. Uh, the U.S. is not going to be supplanted. Uh, United States first. I mean, you had uh, Secretary Raimondo actually saying last week, he just said the key to containing China is for the world to build factories in the United States. I don't know how that would play very well with uh, uh, Europe. 
who have their own problems. But I mean, there is this kind of, you know, the U.S. is the leader of the world and the world owes it to the United States to, uh, to keep it there in order to um, uh, prevent any threats uh, that China might be. Uh, the question is, what are the threats that China poses? They have not declared any wars. They have not engaged in any conflicts. Uh, and they have really only become a threat because of the success of their economics over the last 40 years versus the kind of sideways movement of both of, of many of the uh, developed nations. That's a very good point you make. All right, um, I know, Tenjin, I really appreciate you coming on and for your analysis. Thank you.